Hey, what's up everyone? The Chris Salim here and today we're going to talk about high pass filters. I'm going to share with you how I use them and also some common mistakes. All right, so now before we dive in, if you're new here on the channel, feel free to subscribe to the channel to click the notification bell so you don't miss anything. And if you guys enjoy the video and you find that the video is helpful, please share and like. Okay, now let's talk about high pass filters. If you're new to mixing and you're wondering what a high pass filter do, it's very simple. It will get rid of all the frequencies or attenuate frequencies below a chosen frequency that you set up yourself on your equalizer. Uh, so as you can see here uh, on my Fab Filter Pro Q3 that I love to use, my chosen frequency is at 57 Hertz with a 6 dB per octave slope. Um, so that will slowly attenuate the frequencies below that point. So this is basically what a high pass filter will do. Um, now, using uh, a 6 dB per octave slope is going to give me a much smoother uh, cut. And if I bring that up, like 24 dB per octave, for example, that is going to give me a more drastic cut. Throughout a mix, I'm mainly going to use a 6 dB per octave or a 12 dB per octave slope, which is a bit more smooth uh, when, I, when I work with a high pass filter, because a lot of time, uh, for example, if, I, if I'm working on a guitar, an acoustic guitar, electric guitar, or pad, my goal is not necessarily to get rid of all the frequencies below that chosen frequency, but to just slowly attenuate and slowly get rid of all those frequencies, uh, but gradually, you know, and also there's phase shift issues uh, at, that at 6 dB per octave is almost unexistent. So I'm going to talk to you more about that later in the video. Now, what a high pass filter can do for you in your mix. Uh, first of all, it can tone shape your sound. Um, if you're looking to work on a special effect, you can actually do this with a high pass filter. If you want to tone shape your sound to get that radio effect on a vocal, for example, you can get rid of all those low frequencies and also uh, using a, a low pass filter to do the opposite and do that on the high part of the spectrum and just you know focus on the mids and that will give you that radio effect. So this is the kind of stuff we can do with those types of filters uh, to tone shape your sound and also just to craft your sound in the context of the mix. A high pass filter is also going to be good to clean up the mud out of your sound and add brightness to your sound afterwards if you have a muddy sound that you that you work with. Also very good to remove unwanted sounds, noise, rumble um, that you can find in the low end of the spectrum. Um, even in the super low end where we can't even hear it, uh, like anything below 20 hertz, usually humans, unless you're a superhuman, usually humans are not able to hear anything below 20 hertz. But that doesn't mean that there's nothing going down there. Okay. So that's why I do use a high pass filter to take care of those frequencies on almost all of my tracks. If I don't, what's going to happen is if I have a lot of information down there, that information, that energy, that low end energy is going to build up the further I go into my mix by adding plugins, processing, uh, compression on my tracks, on my, uh, on my buses, on my mix bus. You know, all of that low end energy and information is going to add up and that will kill my headroom. And it's going to stop me to get that punchy and loud mix in the end. So to avoid this, I will high pass the lower end of the spectrum. In that case, if I do so, I will definitely use a higher slope. So as we can see here, I have some information down there so I can just get rid of that, you know. Uh, so this is my starting point when, I, when I'm working with a sound, I check what's, what's happening down there. And the good thing with a plugin like the FabFilter Pro Q3, um, it gives me a chance to see what's happening below 20 hertz. Uh, you can also use SPAN, which is a, a, a frequency analyzer that is free that you can use uh, that will show you the same thing. Um, so this is something that I like to do and that I do a lot on a lot of my tracks when I mix. And I also do this on the kick and the bass. It's not even if those are uh, low frequency instruments, um, I'm not afraid to cut what's below 20 hertz on those instruments if I need to anyways, um, just to, uh, to add a bit more tightness to my low end, a bit more control to the low end. Because the thing with high pass filtering, it's not only about getting rid of the low end, but it's mainly used in my opinion 
to shape your low end, okay? To make, to make sure you control the low end better on your mix. So this is the way I like to use a high pass filter. Uh, now, talking about kick and bass, another very good use of a high pass filter is to use it to give some clarity, punch, definition, and warmth to your kick and bass by adding that high pass filter on some tracks that are fighting in the same bass frequency spectrum than the kick and the bass. Uh, by having a lot of energy going on there, um, chances are that your kick and your bass will not be as punchy as they could. And by adding a high pass filter on those tracks that are fighting in that area, that will help your kick and bass to get more punch, warmth, and definition. Okay, so this is another very good use of a high pass filter. Now let's talk about common mistakes. The first one I have in mind is adding a high pass filter on all of your tracks at a high chosen frequency, except for the kick and the bass. And this is something common. And this is something that I don't suggest you to do, okay? So don't have like a default frequency value on your high pass filter for all of your tracks every time you start your mix. It's a case by case type of thing. So if you had a high pass filter at 200 hertz on all of your tracks at, except the kick and the bass, Chances are that you're going to weak up your mix. Your mix is going to sound thin and harsh. Okay, and this is not something you want. Bass frequencies are very important in a lot of different tracks and sources. And it's not only the kick and the bass. Um, low frequencies on the vocal can be important on a mix. Uh, same for an acoustic guitar, same for an electric guitar, uh, a piano, and so on. So that's why it depends on what you're mixing, the genre of music you're mixing. Um, it depends on the relationship between all of those tracks in the context of the mix. Uh, those are uh, all the factors um, that I think of when using any sorts of EQing techniques um, and same for high pass filtering. And another very common mistake is not to listen in context. Um, always soloing the track and uh, just uh, decide at which frequency point you want to set up your high pass filter uh, in solo. And this is something that can be good to start with to get, you know, to tone shape your sound to make sure you're not missing uh, anything important within the tone of your sound. But you need to uh, make your final decisions in the context of the mix. Okay, and this is something that is very important because sometimes uh, when you listen to the context of the mix and your guitars, um, you need to just bring, bring that up to 90 hertz. Okay, and that works very well in the context of the mix. But when you solo those guitars, maybe they're not going to sound as good as you wanted. Okay, but in the context of the mix, that is the perfect blend. And this is what's important. Uh, maybe you're going you're gonna to have to bring that up a bit more. Okay. And in solo, it's not going to sound very good, you know, maybe a bit thin, but in the context of the mix, this is where the kick and the bass will shine more. And the blend between uh, all of those tracks is going to work well in context. Okay. So always Check in solo, sure, but always mix in context, especially when it comes to high pass filters, okay? Now, just a quick tip here, if you're not very experienced in mixing, um, and mixing in context is a bit tricky and confusing for you and don't hear all the elements all together. It's, and it's harder to, 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 to take the right decisions, especially when setting up your high pass filter. So if you're adding a high pass filter on a track uh, that is fighting in the low frequencies with the kick and the bass, just solo the kick, the bass, and that instrument and work in this context of the mix to make your decision. And afterwards, bring all the other tracks and you'll see if that fits or not. And that's a way you can gain experience on mixing in context. Another very common mistake is to use drastic curves on your high pass filter on all of your tracks, okay? Um, that can be done on, you know, on some tracks if if needed, okay, there's nothing wrong with that. I tend to stay between 6 dB per octave to 12 dB per octave in general, because I love to have, like I was saying, I love to have a smooth uh, cut when it comes to high pass filtering. And also there's the phase shift issues that I was telling you about earlier. And this is what I want to show you on uh, at this part on this part of the videos. Okay, look at my wave form here, okay? Uh, now I'm going to bring a 36 dB per octave slope at 128 hertz. And look what's going to happen to my waveform when I, I'm going to activate that, uh, that filter. I get a phase shift. 
and the higher the slope, the higher the shift. But if I bring that down to 6 dB per octave and I bypass it, there's not a lot of shift going on. But the higher I go, if I go to 12 dB per octave, I'm going to get a bit more uh, phase shifting. Now, by itself, it's not a problem, okay? You're not going to hear the difference when soloing a track and playing with those curves um, as far as the phase goes. It, it doesn't matter much on an individual track. Where it matters is when the uh, that track was recorded at the same time as another track. And it's in a relation, it's in phase relation with another track. Like for example, um, a kick drum that was mic'd with two microphones or a snare drum with the top and bottom microphone or an electric guitar amp uh, mic'd with two mics. Okay. Now the relationship between those two tracks are going to be very important. That's why we work on phase and the polarity when we, uh, when we do some recording, when we record one source with two or more microphones. Okay, so we make sure that uh, they're all phased align uh, when recorded. But if you mess up with one of those tracks and you add up a high pass filter uh, or different high pass filters on all of those different tracks, you're gonna mess up the phase correlation between those tracks. Okay, and even if you don't hear a difference that much, it is gonna add up in the end. Okay, so this is something that I usually don't do. What I do instead, if I'm recording a guitar amp, okay, with three microphones or two microphones, I am gonna take those and create a bus group, okay? Uh, and then on that bus, on that group, I am gonna add my high pass filter. So this way, my phase between those two, uh, those two tracks are gonna stay the same and I'll be able to add my high pass filter after all. But in the case where you really need to, uh, uh, to high pass one track and not the other, for example, a kick drum, you know, you need to high pass the, uh, the outside kick and not the inside kick, uh, you can use a linear phase EQ, and, okay? And that is gonna solve the problem. Uh, for example, if I was gonna bring that up to 48 dB per octave, and at this point it's at zero latency, and I'm gonna bring that to linear phase. And as you can see, if I just bypass the plugin, there's nothing going on. Okay, so this is what a linear phase EQ will do. But you can be stuck with some pre-ring, which is another issue that I might gonna talk about on a future video. So this is basically what you need to know about high pass filters. Have a reason to use them, don't be afraid to use them, and make sure you use them to your advantage and to make your mix sound better than the other way around. All right, guys, so I hope that was helpful. If so, feel free to share, to like, and to subscribe to this channel if you're new here. And again, if you have any questions or comments, please leave everything down below. Until next time, see you.